Our next speaker will tell us six ways to leverage virtual shopper research. Joining us now is Diana Sheehan, GVP of Client Services and Insights at In Context Solutions. Diana? Thank you so much, um, and, and I am very happy to be here um, with all of you to talk a little bit about virtual research. Um, where we're going to start is actually kind of simple. We are in a bit of an unprecedented time. 2020 for retail has been, it's been a lot of things. Um, if you think about the last three months, at the, the first week of March, Target came out and they laid out their strategy for the coming year, 2020 into 2021, and they had great news. Ecom was growing, but they were booming with their small format store. Their tech, kind of their approach to, to technology had really evolved, how they engaged with shoppers. The truth is, after the data breach a few years ago, Target had struggled to come back, and yet 2019, 2018 seemed to be the years in which they really revitalized who they were. Three weeks later, they came out, pulled all their guidance, for the next, for the rest of the fiscal year, stopped all of the store openings, halted remodels, and said, we need to focus on what's happening now. And the truth is, for all of us, what's happening now has basically just been a world of triage. Um, I would, as I joined um, kind of throughout the day, you, know, we, you guys are asking questions about COVID. What is the impact of COVID on retail, on sampling? in-store versus couponing? What is the impact of COVID on a number of different factors? The truth is the impact of COVID is, is, is still so much in flux that none of us know. So as Target came out just today with some of their Q1 results, as Walmart announced yesterday some of their Q1 results, what you are seeing is that everyone is trying to figure it out. That starts with the retailers, it's next going to the manufacturers, but at the end of the day, it is all driven by the single most important person in the retail landscape, the shopper. So whether it's someone who's working in manufacturing or retailing, or you as an individual going shopping, you, and, you are driving the ship that ultimately is letting retailers determine how best to adapt to you. And what's interesting about that is that you shopped drastically different as a person as you went through the pandemic process shopping. That is what has driven kind of this change in retail, this shift and momentous shift in retail over the last few weeks, um, over the last few months, right? So what do we know about the pandemic shopping? Well, I mean, it looks like retail, particularly gross retail, has got, retail has gone gangbusters. Huge, huge sales increases, comp store sales, for all of the major grocery retailers, for Walmart, for Target, all up significantly. On the opposite side, as you step outside of essential shopping, you've seen the other thing, JCPenney finally going bankrupt. They have to call it, right? J. Crew, a number of different players finally saying that retail has changed so much, and we just, with this massive change in what has happened, cannot compete the way that we used to compete. Well, as you sit and you think through what all of this means, well, it, it, it's, it's this t very conflicting tale, um, right? Revenue is up. All of these categories are growing. If you're a manufacturer in one of those peak categories, you know, your, your, num your revenue numbers have never been so strong in traditional retail. But on the other side, from a retailer's perspective, you're growing in low-margin categories. You're paying your employees more hazard pay to try to keep them safe or at least keep them incented so that they can keep coming. There's been a huge shift to e-commerce. I think in, in what I was, as I was kind of listening into the recording, um, I think Target said that um, shipped services are up 600% year over year. Curbside is up over 1,000%. Yes, we are talking about a teeny tiny base in 2019 when you do the year-over-year -year comparisons, but think about that. We're not talking about 20%, 30% growth. We're talking about 1,000% growth 
in sales, moving away from the physical store into the e-commerce landscape that is less profitable for these retailers. And what's interesting is this has been one of the single biggest triggers to change how we shop. And it's actually something, that, candidly, I would argue before all of this, you have shoppers that are shopping via e-commerce today that would never even have thought about it if it weren't for COVID, except now they like it and they're not going to go away. I'll give you a perfect example. I am a mom. I have three kids, 13 through six. I live by e-commerce shopping. My, my commute on the train into Chicago was literally putting together my Instacart order because it's the only way I could keep everything going. My mom, who is not going to be named from an age perspective, lives in a very small town in South Texas. She still won't put her credit card in to the Amazon orders. She buys Amazon gift certificates because she's afraid of security. She just ordered her first HEB online order. She's never going back. She loved it. So that element of people are trying this in times that are different and liking it is going to now change how we move forward into an e-commerce meets bricks and mortar landscape. But beyond that, you've got other elements that then move back in into the supply chain, the manufacturers. A lot of these really, really, uh, these manufacturers that are benefiting from sales within the physical store are actually hurting because the food service channels are gone, or the hotel channels are gone, or the cafeterias and schools are gone. And so, as you think of pandemic shopping and how are we as an industry are going to have to adapt, it's, it's as if when we win, we lose in a number of different ways. And as such, we're going to have to just rethink how we tackle everything. Now, we have done some research. And, and one of the things that we know as we think about virtual, so we step back, right? We know things are changing. What does that ultimately mean holistically? Well, what that ultimately means is that virtual reality, which is not new to research, in Context Solutions has been around for over a decade. And while we've worked with various partners in different ways, there's also competitors out there who've been around for a decade. So you as manufacturers and retail partners are using virtual reality. How do we think about using virtual reality in a very focused way and then expanding and get creative? They're able to continue to work, but work in a world that is a new normal in which we're not always physically coming together, in which we're not always going to be able to make and test and learn about concepts within a physical store, and candidly, in which we may just have to rethink things that we never even thought this would apply to until today. So we kind of sat down as, as, a, as a company and we thought through this. Well, one of the easiest ways and the most real-time ways that you can use virtual reality, particularly the virtual shopping trip, is to test is testing. How are consumers shopping today in a, in a store that might be structured to be the perfect setup? And how is that different than what you're seeing in the physical store today with out-of-stocks and things like that? Or on the opposite side, are we able to potentially get a respondent into the mindset of their normal shopping occasion and start to test out things that might work conceptually in the store that we want to recommend to our retail partners or as retailers that we want to explore? Can we do that virtually and be able to continue to move forward with strategies and test and learn from those strategies without the limitations of what is happening right now in the physical store. You know, as you think about how you partner, and I say this as someone who actually grew up um, in working for a manufacturer calling on retailers, you know, can we think differently about how we do category reviews, how we test different concepts? Can we even test concepts that maybe and determine should they be out there, should they not be out there from a signage perspective, from a store layout perspective? All of those things actually go beyond how we, a lot of companies use virtual reality today, but create an opportunity to really maximize and optimize what you choose to move forward with, um, with the safety net of actually getting consumer responses and reactions to what you want to do, even in an uncertain environment. 
And as you go and you think really outside the box, if you're not in food or in, in food and beverage from an industry perspective, let's say instead you're in apparel or you're in consumer electronics, you know, a lot of, of industries outside of, of traditional CPG, they do a lot of sourcing from other countries. A lot of times that sourcing is done by physically going to, say, China and looking at what's available, going to Milan for a fashion show, going somewhere to look at assortment and make decisions on what you buy. In a world where that's not possible and when it is possible, you may be less open to making that trip, whether it's a short distance or a long distance, is there a way to start changing how you look at those portfolio of products that you want to invest in or the supplies that you want to invest in and use virtual reality and a virtual kind of setup to pick and choose what makes sense versus trying to really think of it in a 2D lens of here's a picture and here's a picture. Um, and then lastly, and again, this is this idea of really taking virtual reality and changing how we even think about using it, and it goes even beyond research. As you look at new hires coming into manufacturers, people starting within um, the retail world that might not be able to physically travel to the different types of stores and look at things and learn from things, can you actually look at that virtual store and create training programs and exercises that allow you to minimize cost for travel, um, minimize the time needed to do things and allow people to really grow and develop from the safety of their own home. And even as things evolve, because it's gonna take time, to potentially even create new ways and new opportunities to train people that haven't historically been done in the past. So let's start with virtual reality kind of from a starting point. Um, we did some research. We've actually been doing ongoing research since week two of the kind of, of, of everything being shelter in place. And, and what we did is for the most part, we've been doing virtual research as I said for years. We wanted to see, we wanted to get a first view of how, they, how are shoppers responding differently in a virtual shopping environment versus say two months ago. And then beyond that, what are things we could do to normalize how our research is done so that people can continue to do research even when so much else is on pause. One, a couple of things that we found is, is candidly, virtual um, reality research, we were able to get consistent response rates, and, and candidly, with COVID, we're actually even getting stronger response rates from some of the harder to reach um, consumer groups because more people are at home and looking for something to do. But what we found is in those virtual shopping trips, um, if you can change and frame your, essentially your instructions, to the respondents, you're able to actually get them to step outside of what's in their head today as far as how they would shop and move them into a more kind of normal mindset. And so when we first tested, we found out things like, you know, people are buying 12 multi-packs of, of bottled water and six rolls of toilet paper or six things of toilet paper. And then when we refilled it and we changed the setting and really said, Think about how you would shop either pre-COVID or post-COVID in a normal setting. You know, how did that behavior change from cell to cell? And we found that we were able to get to a more normal response based on historic fielding than we did without the instructions. And again, this is actually the power of virtual shopping is by nature of what we do, you are setting consumers in a mindset to shop for a specific type of occasion. So it's why you can do research on seasonal selling and optimizing in March for December, because you just have to say, think about a holiday shopping trip. How would you do X, Y, and Z? What we also found is um, regardless of what you do to normalize things, there are certain behaviors that in this COVID world, outside of true pandemic stock up, that are not changing. And this is something because we have fielded with consistency over the last eight to 10 weeks that we started to see some of these things aren't changing. 
And some of the things that aren't changing are things like people are just buying more. And it's something that is, we're consistently hearing in basket size um, data released by retailers and things like that, right? If you are stuck at home, or maybe not stuck at home is the right word, but if you are home with your family and all of your children, you are simply going to need more food. They're not eating away from home. You're not eating your lunches away from home. You're not doing grab-and-go breakfast. And so you need all of that within the house. Um, it is also amazing, but when you have time on your hands, there's very little to do. My 85-year-old, my 85-pound, 11-year-old daughter ate an entire frozen pizza by herself. It's amazing not only how much we eat, but how often we eat in circumstances like this. And so as long as people are going to be in this kind of slowly evolving COVID world, you're going to see behavior from a shopping perspective that does look a little abnormal. Um, the other thing is really that idea of as you think about shopping, how does that change? when things go back to normal. If people have gotten accustomed to cooking most of their meals at home, are they going to run out and return to that share of stomach kind of dialogue of eating out more because they've gotten used to this habit? Or is it that they're actually going to do more eating out because they haven't had the chance and they just are tired of cooking? Those are things that you can kind of ask about, um, but we don't know the answers to whereas we do know things like people are buying more food at this point and will likely continue to buy more food if they are home in the circumstances that they are in now. What we also found in this research, and we've seen this with consistency as we've tracked over time, is this e-com conversation where I really started, right? So what's, what I want to point out here, and I think this is critical to understand, the world of retail, particularly grocery retail, consumables retail, is not an all or nothing, right? You don't have a shopper who embraces online grocery and stops going to the store. In fact, what you have is, is you move to a world in which people are simply going through both paths. But with that said, then you've got to think through the implications. If I am doing research that is focused on the physical store layout, which is what a lot of virtual shopping does today, I need to now account for the fact that, say, 20% of my category sales are going to come online. So do I have a digital category strategy plan in place, or do I need to start thinking about that? And if I need to start thinking about that, since many of our companies generally tackle e-commerce in a different space from traditional physical category management, how do I need to rethink who I partner with to bring my retailer recommendations? How do I need to rethink how I talk to my retailer who also often has a separate e-commerce arm from their traditional merchants? How do we start changing the conversation to be more integrated as opposed to siloed? And the last thing, and this is again consistent with what we've been seeing and hearing in a lot of places, as we think of crisis mode testing, right, is, okay, we know in this current landscape that things are moving to e-commerce. And that there is, while there's likely not going to be such a high spike, that we're going to start then seeing a leveling out, but then a consistent kind of increase in e-commerce. What we're also seeing is that consumers at this point in time have very quickly moved to that price conscious mindset. All you hear about on, in the news today is the elements of the economy, what is going to change, right? We have, um, at this point, 15% of the U.S. population that, is, that wants to be employed is not employed. That is going to have a lasting effect, at least over the next six to nine months, possibly longer, on how they want to shop. They are already moving into the recession mindset. That's not going to change in the near term. So as you think through some of those strategies, and that's where we'll get into the next round of how virtual research can help you today, as they move into that mindset, we as an industry need to think through how do we support our consumers when they're acting more and more like they did back in 2008 and 2009, except now there is the e-commerce spin to that that adds a level of complexity that is unexpected. So as we go through and we think through that, this is kind of an idea of how we use virtual shopping 
to test what is happening today. So that crisis mode testing and being able to then get within a few days responses about how we anticipated consumers to change, integrating in their actual buying behavior from a virtual shopping trip. Next, as we think through this, the question becomes, okay, as you think of how all of that's done and where it goes, right, this is kind of a repeat of what I just talked about, um, respondents today are different because they are home. And so as you kind of do research, you need to account for that because you don't, you want to make sure to use your quotas to be reflective of the average American, not the first American to respond. But also know things like people are buying bigger packs because they're consuming more because they are home. Um, different sizes than they would normally buy are integrated in that as well. Um, and there is a shift to less expensive brands, particularly things like private label. Private label is in for a heck of a year and possibly a heck of a decade. If you, if anything is, if any, there was already momentum over the last five to, to ten years in private brands becoming increasingly more trusted um, and, and being embraced across consumer groups. This is going to push that needle even further, and I would anticipate as you start to build category strategies. Um, you're going to see that we're going to start looking a lot more like Europe than we ever have in the past. Um, you're going to see that Aldi, Lidl, who just opened its 100th store um, officially in the last week in Georgia, um, you're going to see them to continue to grow. You're going to see discounters continue to grow because we are moving no matter what happens into at least a short-term recession, and if it's a longer-term recession, all of those trends that you saw that grew out of the 2008 and 2009 recession are going to start to impact how we do business today. So as we continue on from there, this is really then that idea of, of taking virtual. So virtual testing in real time, trying to get at specific things, is one way that allows you in a cost-effective way to understand what's happening. Now, how do you use virtual to really rethink how you partner with your retailers? Well, the truth is, at this point, no retailer is really thinking about how am I going to reset my shelves in the back half of the year. They are still continuing to be triage. They are going through, they're trying to figure out how to keep their workers going, particularly as they pull back on hazard pay. They're trying to understand what's going to happen until there is a vaccine. And so for them, this is more about day to day and less about what is the future of my store going to look like. That doesn't mean they nor you aren't trying to plan for when it is appropriate to tackle those things. Virtual, rea or virtual reality testing allow you to conceptually start to play with these concepts in a store, just not a physical store, that digital store. And then through research to be able to get consumers feedback, not only on what they like and don't like about it, but how does what they see impact their buying behavior through a shopping exercise. Um, what, what, what the power of virtual does is it also takes, and it's not just about testing, right? Right now, I would anticipate that there are none of us who are being asked to go visit our retail merchants or retailer merchants in the office. Um, what we can do using virtual is you can actually then take that virtual shopping experience that you have visualized, that you have created, and you can share that with your buyers in a real-time basis. You could potentially even go through and stream to them what the vision is, get their feedback, get their input. Retailers, as you are partnering across organizations to understand how to lay things out, you can do all of that through um, virtual reality online and start to continue to or basically move forward and make decisions about what you want that category or that store to look like in 2021 now instead of waiting until you can actually mock it up in a physical store. What you also have is within that the idea to test concepts that you're not sure about. Anything from a shelf layout, package testing, display testing, signage, all of those things, again, in a virtual store, you're able to show to its consumer respondents you're able to actually challenge them to then shop that store as they normally would, and then you're able to, to ask them on the back end what it is that drove what their behavior is. And we can do that not only quantitatively through traditional primary research, but we can also do that qualitatively by actually using kind of a facilitated 
um, essentially a moderated focus group to show them the store experience and then get their responses that way. So it's one of those elements where that the, using virtual reality as a tool in any of the research conversations that you are having today, that tie to the store becomes something that remains feasible because you're doing it digitally instead of physically. The other thing is really this idea of, of how do you stand out. So as you think about testing in general, um, the idea is how do you break through? How do you get consumers' perspectives? How do you get them to stop and pay attention in a crowded store? That store becomes even more crowded today, in part because um, even as we go through the COVID epidemic, now what you have is you have shoppers who are not browsing. I don't know anyone who is going to a grocery store today and browsing. In fact, if they have to go in the physical store, they are getting in and out as quickly as they can. If they are shopping via e-commerce, it would be even harder to break through if you don't have packaging or something to call their attention to something new that you're doing. Again, using virtual, you will are able to test things like, hey, do they stop when they see your package? If they stop when they see their package, how long does it take for them to, to you know, do they pick you up? That not only do they pick you up, do they actually put you in their cart? You're able to go through and track all of that in this virtual shopping experience. You're able to compare that to competitors within the market or within that category set. Um, even things like, can they even find you? So if you went through a package change and you embedded them on the store shelf that you have today, um, and then you change that store shelf, you can see the time it takes them to find you in different locations and be able to make decisions on whether those are really meeting the mark and what you need from a virtual perspective um, or from a, from a store perspective using that virtual shopping space in a safe way um, while also getting that real-time feedback on not only if they want to purchase you, but if they do, why. And then as you move into that sourcing conversation, um, look, you know, the idea, uh, we, I, we don't know what travel is going to look like in six months. We don't know what it's going to look like in a year. I think we do know that at least in the near future, things are going to be different and we aren't going to travel the way that we used to. Um, I think that what you will ultimately find is in these places where, particularly for sourcing, um, for some of those categories where you do have to travel to decide what you want to do, you're not going to be able to get taste and feel, but it's a lot more um, representative of what the products are that you're going to choose in a virtual environment because you get that full 3D image um, and experience of what it would look like on a shelf set. Um, if you, things like honestly doing um, potentially virtual layouts that are mocked up on an avatar for apparel, all of those things are possible today. Um, and, and so you are able to just really engage more interactively um, versus potentially just trying to do something over looking at a list of products um, or via a Zoom call or things like that. And so I think this is a place, to, can, to be fully transparent, this is very much outside of the box. This is looking at things in a way um, that we haven't looked at at all but it creates an opportunity to rethink how we might want to tackle some of these things in a different way in which everyone can be together, um, but not through, say, a conference call um, or through streaming and then be able to make purchase decisions at the same time together even when you're not. And then the last piece of this use of virtual research is to, to think about training. And, and so one of the places where we really envision significant opportunity um, for virtual reality is, is particularly in things like retail training, whether it's for account teams or it's, it's for, um, as you would think through, say, um, your, your various um, third-party DSD providers. Um, virtual reality truly does allow people to make that full trip through the store. So if you were sitting there and you as, as a new employee need to understand how to check to see if a shelf is specced out according to best practices or to see it, how to figure out like how to look for an out of stock or even how to figure out what do I look for in the back room if I have to pull things up and what does that experience look like? Is signage the right way? Um, Am I validating things that I know are supposed to be as they should be? 
Um, you can give someone a guidebook that shows pictures of what are happening, but there is nothing like actually walking the store. And I say this, I say this um, being someone who 18 years ago, one of my, my biggest training moments was walking around. My boss was, had 30 years of experience in retail and being able to hear him explain to me things like why Xbox was in this location versus Y box and how that impacted things and what the implications would be if that was missing and how to then go back and ask the manager to pull out stock, right? So those are things that, they, that a lot of times that physical experience of doing that with somebody becomes increasingly more meaningful because it sticks. You can still do that even if you're not together using virtual reality. You just tweak it, right? You could use, I mean, if, we're all, if we get to a point where we all come together, you could actually use headsets that are then projected on a screen. So your training partner can actually explain to you what you're seeing as you talk them through what you're looking for. Um, until then, you can use virtual reality and then flip that into a video and then have that same experience via Zoom call. So taking things like training, whether it's from a retailer perspective or a manufacturer perspective, and moving in that into the virtual landscape, um, not only in, in the cases like today where you may not be able to get into the physical store, but also when you move into things like how do I save costs on training and development but still give people that really strong and effective opportunity to grow and learn in, in something that is more realistic this becomes that opportunity, particularly as you deal with technology, um, that, that almost seems real um, because it's based so much off gaming platforms. Anyone who's played video games recently knows how real these things can be, and this allows you to take that technology and just escalate, or elevate it to a new height, but with, also with a new type of, of, of rationale for why you're doing it. So with that said, um, I've kind of taken you very quickly through. I wanted to be conscious of time. I, I, I wanted to take you quickly through just a couple of ways that we are talking to and working with our research partners um, to use virtual reality. Some of these are kind of tried and true. These are the norms, the, the testing um, in, for specific scenarios, the testing of concepts that you want to explore, even kind of category review work. That's kind of been the bread and butter of what virtual reality testing has been for years. But now in this new world, expanding it out to things like sourcing and supply chain as well as training and development have become new opportunities that have been created that allow you to really optimize the investment that you have in an efficient way while also not necessarily sacrificing on the quality of what you're trying to accomplish. So with that, um, thank you very much and open to any questions if there are any. Sure, we've got a couple questions here, Diana. One of them you may have addressed uh, along the way in your presentation, but uh, perhaps you have some extra things to say. Uh, how have shoppers changed in the research you have done, and what do you expect to last versus going back to normal? That's a great question. So um, in the actual shopping experiences, we have, we have definitely seen a, a shift, and it's a consistent shift across categories to private label products. We have seen a shift to purchasing things like large size or multi-packs, or purchasing more units of some of the standard products that you would need in your house every day, things like milk um, or eggs uh, or cereal. Um, and then we've also, um, I, I think those are things that are universal. As you go category to category, you may see other elements of change. Um, but as you look across categories, those are really the two things that, that seem to um, be very consistent, not only in the virtual shopping trip. So them actually saying, I'm purchasing this and checking out. So putting something in their basket and checking out. But then also that is essentially validated as you go back and you ask questions after the shopping ex exercise about how they expect their behavior to change um, in the future world. So it's like we've got We've got, we have that beautiful ability to kind of combine not only what they say they're going to do, but also 
beforehand in an unbiased perspective, actually being able to see them do it and then just not know that we're able to compare versus historic. And, and so they, they don't know that we're validating that through the combination of what they say and what they do. Okay, one more question. Uh, have you used a virtual reality for the training of sales teams? Yes, and and I, I did. I, I know I tackled that a bit, but um, yeah, we 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 have and actually are in the process of of really launching a couple of programs with um, partners um, where they are are, are going to basically pilot using this as part of their training and development program. Um, they'll build out scenarios, kind of case studies that people would go through. Um, in this instance. Um, it, it, a lot of the conversation has been focused more on things like tapping into VR headsets and, and basically having people do that via, via, via VR headsets. Um, obviously, in this new world order, you're not going to send everyone a VR headset at this point in time, um, although that really could be something that comes down the road. So it's one where there's also the ability to convert that into a streaming exercise online, and people can still go through the experience it's not as immersive, but they can do it on their computers, at their desks, at home, and then simply, again, in this moderated kind of combination between streaming and meeting, then have the trainers continue to support them one-on-one -on -one as they do it online. Okay, uh, one more question that I, I think you also addressed in your presentation. What types of test and learn concepts can you do? And I think that's it, right? So for us, the, there are those standards. There's package testing and shelf, shelf layout testing. Um, there is signage testing and display testing. Um, but some of the places that we, we are seeing more and more interest is understanding things like how do you rearrange store layout? How do you test adjacencies? How do you navigate a store? That's actually something that's been a really, really big thing, particularly with manufacturers as they look to, say, launch a new product and they're not really sure where it fits or they have a, long, uh, a set of products that have been in the marketplace for an ex a, a long period of time, but they think they belong in a different place. Um, there has been a lot of really cool findings in things essentially that we call navigation studies, where we are actually telling the shopper, the, 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 the prompt is actually not, this is a shopping trip, um, and kind of just looking at a set. Instead, it's, it's showing them, it's prompting them with either an or uh, uh, describing a category and saying, where do you expect to find this? And it's one of those that really, both for retailers and manufacturers, allows people to understand not only where consumers expect to find a product, but if it's in that, then test test. If it does, but in a compare and contrast from um, different cells, um, are they able to then see a boost in how things sell because it's where it's supposed to be? Um, so things like that are all standard research that we do. We also do a lot of visualization. So if you are not necessarily at the testing, but more conceptually want to get buy-in from a retailer, let's say you've designed, you have a new planogram that you want to embed your category captain, um, but you want to really bring it to life for your retail partner so that they can understand what you're trying to see in a few, for a future of the category, you can use this virtual reality, reality piece not only to test what is the best option, but then to take that experience and share it with your retail partners to really bring the concept to life. Okay, excellent. I thought that was a very, a very good presentation. I learned a lot about virtual shopper research that I never knew. So uh, thank you very much, Diana. And if you want to follow up with Diana for more information, you can, on the screen you can call her, you can email her, you can follow her on Twitter, and also follow her in Context Solutions on Twitter. All that information is on the screen. Thank you again, Diana. Thank you.